good day. <laughs> And welcome again to DCAMP's webinar exploring how law enforcement in Latin America are addressing gender-based violence during the time of COVID. This is both a critical and a timely discussion. Critical because gender-based violence is the world's most prevalent human rights abuse. And timely because the data increasingly show that many types of gender-based violence, such as domestic violence, have been exacerbated by the global COVID pandemic. Law enforcement agencies, particularly police as first responders, have been at the center of this issue and many governments response. We've now learned from diverse experiences that a securitized response to a public health crisis has unintended and unexpected impacts on the victims of gender-based violence. As we examine police responses to the pandemic and to gender-based violence, it's important to remember that police have a responsibility to ensure that all people are treated respectfully and crimes against them dealt with seriously, regardless of gender. This plays an important role in procedural fairness, contributing to the legitimacy of the justice system and increasing the trust, confidence and cooperation of the public. Sensitive handling of crimes based on gender in particular, contribute to a society where discrimination and gender-based violence are not tolerated and where equality is possible. Successful policing advances gender equality by being citizen-oriented, serving the interests and needs of all, and paying attention to groups that have been historically marginalized, such as women, girls, and LGBTI people. Achieving gender equality in and through policing is not simply about adding more women. It's about transforming the power relations that sustain inequality and gender-based violence. It's about protecting the human rights of all people and enabling their full contribution to public life. Integrating a gender perspective is expected of police services by virtue of international and domestic legal obligations, but it's also required to achieve more effective policing, safer societies, and stronger rule of law. DCAF has been involved in improving gendered responses to policing for more than a decade, supporting countries such as Sierra Leone, Liberia, Ukraine, and Lebanon, and working with the distinguished panelists from Colombia and Honduras, who we are honored to have here with us today. And on that note, I want to take this opportunity to thank the Honduran police leadership, as well as the Colombian police, for working with DCAP on their proactive responses to addressing police response to gender-based violence during the COVID pandemic. This level of committed ownership has undoubtedly benefited the people whom they serve and will no doubt bring valuable insights to the discussion. So as you can see from my brief introduction, it's clear that the outcome of this webinar will contribute important lessons to the work of DCAF on best practices in policing and gender in times of crisis. We'll use these lessons to produce a publicly available document to further best practices on these issues. And we offer DCAF's resources to help implement the resulting recommendations. Last year, DCAF published its updated Gender and Security Toolkit, one of its flagship publications, which is a resource for practical pathways and lessons learned in implementing recommendations on mainstreaming gender and policing. I know that you will hear much more about this and other important insights from our panelists today. And with that, I wish us all a fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Really, really important. And as you mentioned there, critical not just for the population, but also for the police as well. And the fact that these lessons learned we share globally is, is very, very important. And I'd now like to pass over to Dr. Christina Hoyos, who is the portfolio lead for DCAF uh, across all of Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, Christina, over to you. Bueno, primero que todo, un cordial saludo desde Ginebra, Suiza. Welcome. First of all, greetings from Geneva, Estamos muy contentos, muy We are very happy. Que la traducción we se are está... very happy that the translation is... No, 
Perdón, pero la, la traducción yeah, se está sorry. escuchando. Hay un no, problema no, trans, técnico. Well, well, apparently there's a technical problem with the translation, is there? Uh, perdón. Maybe, maybe, maybe try mute original. Yeah. Oh, mute original audio. Ahora sí. Bueno, primero que todo, después de esta cuestión técnica, un cordial, un cordial saludo desde Ginebra. Nosotros estamos súper contentos de tener más de 350 personas registradas en este evento. Y yo estamos muy contentos de, de tener esta discusión precisamente con invitados desde Honduras, desde Colombia, Paraguay, Chile, Bolivia y México, eh, y eh, Perú. Y estamos muy contentos de tener un debate sobre las posibles recomendaciones que pueden salir de este evento, así como lo mencionó Cristina Finch, donde vamos a tener finalmente un documento que vamos a estar compartiendo. Eh, nosotros estamos en este momento en una situación supremamente complicada de COVID. Precisamente el tema de género y violencia ha aumentado en todas partes del mundo. Eh, nosotros pensamos que precisamente este evento nos va a ayudar a dar una, un, unas, unas guías que pueden ser utilizadas en otros países. Y pensamos que que precisamente ahora eh, este evento que es una iniciativa por parte de, eh, del gobierno de Honduras eh, y estamos muy contentos que la Surma Reyes como jefa de la División de Género e Igualdad eh, está eh, iniciando este, este buen debate con los otros países. Eh, nosotros para dar una pequeña presentación de FLAC, estamos trabajando en Colombia en varios frentes, no solamente en el tema de género, sino en el Congreso Nacional para crear mejores capacidades en el control legislativo del sector de seguridad. Estamos trabajando también en el tema de medios de comunicación y la policía, que pensamos precisamente en este momento son temas importantes para abordar. Eh, estamos trabajando en el tema de la protección de derechos humanos, de defensores de derechos humanos. Y estamos trabajando también en el tema de la autoevaluación de género. Y nosotros pensamos que el trabajo que se ha hecho en Colombia fue supremamente importante porque nosotros acabamos de terminar esta autoevaluación donde se eh, participaron 144 mil policías y tuvimos un respaldo del 90% de, de esta población entrevistada. Creo que este resultado es muy importante porque esto muestra que hay un interés muy grande de conocer cómo, están las, cómo está la policía en Colombia en varios temas relacionados con el tema de género. Precisamente DICAF eh, eh, desarrolló una metodología para hacer un análisis exhaustivo de los temas de género y pensamos que precisamente ahora, como en Colombia es la primera vez que se aplica, eh, pensamos que puede ser un instrumento muy interesante para otros países a nivel internacional eh, y en América Latina sobre todo. Honduras precisamente también eh, está llevando a cabo esta autoevaluación y precisamente pensamos que las, el intercambio de experiencias puede ser interesante para los dos países. Para volver un poco al tema del, del COVID y analizando un poco los datos internacionales, nosotros vemos, vemos claramente que hay una, eh, un aumento considerable en el, eh, en el abuso y en, en, en el tema de, de género de violencia. Y no solamente en, en América Latina, tenemos datos, por ejemplo, de Argentina, donde han aumentado las llamadas de urgencias en un 25%. Pero en Europa está en la misma situación, como lo vemos en un documento de Naciones Unidas, donde Francia ha aumentado casi el 30% de llamadas de urgencia por esta situación. Yo creo que eh, aquí hay que tomar unos, unas medidas urgentes, trabajar sobre todo en el tema de 
prevención eh, con estas eh, poblaciones afectadas con el fin de poder mejorar esta situación. Yo estoy convencida que esta, este intercambio de estos siete países en América Latina nos va a dar más luz en este camino que, como lo decía Cristina Finch, es un tema de derechos humanos y tenemos que apoyar mucho más las iniciativas en este campo. Y como hoy estamos precisamente festejando el día de la violencia contra la mujer, pensamos que este evento está precisamente muy bien discutir esto dentro del contexto del público. A todos los participantes, al comisionado Sabas, a todos los que, a, que están presentes, muchas gracias por participar. Y también estamos muy pendientes de, de que nos sigan escuchando en varios de los webinars que estamos organizando para América Latina y el Caribe sobre varios temas que van a seguir. De todas formas, muchas gracias y estamos atentos a las discusiones. Your discussions. Thanks, Christina. I think that shows the, the wealth of work across DCAF and the, uh, the initiative to work with all different countries that is possible as well. Many thanks for that. I can see by the comments there's a we've got a couple of issues on the interpreting and sound volumes, etc., which we will continue to try to uh, solve as we go ahead. But um, I'd now like to pass over to uh, General Sorato of the Honduran National Police who will say some words of introduction. Um, General, it's an honor to have you here and many thanks for, for your time this morning. Um, I'd like to pass over to you for some words of introduction and launching of the event. Thank you very much, Dan, and greetings from uh, these Patacho lands. Uh, also, many greetings to everyone here who represent the DCAP program, as well as to all my colleagues from different police offices in Latin America and all participants in general. For us, this it's an honor really to share um, some time during this morning's webinar to discuss an issue that is so transcendent and of so much importance to us all, to all of our countries. No doubt uh, you have already um, seen what are the trends behind this issue, which are uh, behind gender-based violence. Undubitably, this represents for our country and for the police institution quite the challenge. Um, where we seek the best alternatives to find a solution to these issues. It is clear that uh, through this time of, um, of the health crisis that we're going through, and uh, during these times that we're living, many countries in the world have had to act up throughout the um, path of this pandemic, we've seen an increase in gender-based violence and in violence against women specifically. This represents a problem not only here in Honduras, but rather at the worldwide level, as you have so very aptly said. I believe that this is a magnificent opportunity for us to share our experiences, uh, our lessons learned, and for there to be a sharing of the best practices so we can jointly seek out a solution to these problems and if necessary for us to modify our regulations to um, check uh, the uh, performance thereof if necessary we should also modify our strategies on the field i think that all of this is important because uh, we can debate the issue, we can share our thoughts about it uh, during this event. And I think that Honduras is going through very uh, special times, especially regarding these um, topics at hand. I'd just like to say that we are undergoing a recovery process, a process of reconstruction uh, the damages, uh, both in uh, casualties as well as in, uh, um, in property damage, you know, you know, all of the damage that is generated in the country, specifically in the Sula Valley, which is in the northern part of Honduras, uh, the most productive part of the country, mind you, is currently 
Well, it's currently been severely punished by climate um, issues. So we are undergoing a joint effort with all of the state institutions to try to strengthen and better focus on efforts and, um, just uh, to help uh, the recovery and to um, assist the people who are homeless at the moment or who are living in shelters or who are isolated from their families. All of this pains us enormously. It pains us to see that our brethren, especially the ones from the northern zone of the country, are going through such dire situations. But I would also like to thank this moment to thank the international community because many countries are supporting us and they're providing a friendly hand so we can rise back up from this difficult situation. But, you know, we are quite confident that with our efforts and the accompaniment from the friendly countries, we'll be able to pull through. So, um, in conclusion, uh, with my introductory remarks, I think that this event, just like Christina said, will be able to uh, produce interesting outcomes. So we'll be able to conclude important aspects uh, which will help us redirect the solution to this issue, to this many times silent phenomenon which is ever on the rise. And uh, which uh, will, uh, and which definitely generates much violence. These are aspects that we would like to control, to prevent. Our institution has undergone a process of strengthening. Yesterday, Subcommission Suma was actually uh, referring to the fact that there's always a need to move forward in gender issues. And we quite agree at the level of the general directorate of the uh, of strategies, we should be spearheading issues regarding gender. We know the importance that this, uh, that this theme represents not only in our institution, but throughout the nation. As an institution, this is a theme that we are quite willing to move forward on. Also, we've been strengthening the issue of education because we know that from education is where all of the strengths stem from and transformation will be um, improved as long as our education is improved. I believe that in our system, uh, these topics have intelligently been organized and boosted them. Um, starting from training and also from continuous improvement to the system. This is the way that we create and shape the different mentality that we're aiming for in our police officers. It is clear that there are many challenges yet for us to overcome and this morning's uh, meeting uh, will be very enriching and uh, we'll be able to gather uh, the experiences of different countries. Each of our countries have much to share, much to say, and we think this will all be edifying. It will help us move forward and it will provide effective tools to prevent and control the aforementioned phenomenon, which might generate even more violence than the one that we've been recording, especially during the times of pandemic. As a country, as an institution, we also offer our warmest greetings to um, everyone here. You are all concerned about respecting human rights and you're all working to uh, try to uh, decrease gender violence. And it's great to see that we are all black bearers against this issue and that we're all devoted to ensuring that women's integrity is respected. This is important for society. It is important for us all to grow at the National Honduran Police Force and we are doing everything we can about this. 
every event such as the one we're having this morning is an opportunity for us to grow and learn. So I thank you deeply for uh, your presence in this event. And uh, because I know that by the end of uh, this meeting, we'll have many lessons learned. So once again, thank you. We will uh, be following the development of this event. Good morning. Many thanks, Gerald. Many thanks for your words and for your time. And uh, all of our best wishes go to everyone in Honduras as you go through the recovery after these natural disasters. And, and we can see that even with the impact of these kind of things, it doesn't stop the will that is in the Honduran National Police to continue um, modernization and continue to address these issues. And we see that embodied in, in people like Commissioner Alasul Moreas uh, and also in other internal champions as well. Um, such as Commissioner Osavas. Um, I'd like to pass over to uh, Commissioner Osavas, if I may, for uh, a brief introduction before we start um, the webinar. If, uh, if Commissioner, if you have your video to switch on. Fantastic. Over to you, Commissioner. Right, thank you very much, Jan. How kind of you. Once again, it's a pleasure to greet each and every one of the uh, participants and attendants, as well as my colleagues in Latin American Police Forces. I would like to thank TCAF for organizing this event. It's very important for us to be able to convey our experiences and our vision around this tomb. Well, um, I've been given some minutes, uh, so I should keep my words brief, but I will speak about the community police in regards to gender equality throughout our institutions. The philosophy of the community police is a task that has been implemented for many years now. The majority of our Latin American police forces have been headed towards this, and some have been at a faster track than others, but it is definitely something that we're all moving towards. From my experience, throughout my career in the police institution, I've been linked towards this topic precisely, towards the implementation of the community police philosophy throughout our institution. We've had significant advances, uh, but there is still a lot of road to tread. Now, at the decision-making level uh, from the highest commands of our institution, I believe that the adequate decisions have been made. Uh, Logically, the implementation of the community policing philosophy implies a change in mindset, a change in the perspective of each of our officials. It is something that definitely involves an ongoing process, a long-term process uh, with each of our police members. The philosophy of the community policing is basically based on certain premises that are extremely important and we should always be at the top of the mind of each officer who serves the citizens every day. Now, what are these premises? The first one is establishing a relationship with the community. The officer must be in permanent communication with their communities, with the ones that serve. That relationship obviously has to lead towards an improved communication and which ends up simplifying, if you will, the work that our um, officers do. And why? Because if there's good communication, because if there's a full understanding of uh, how to avoid crimes and the problems in the community, then, then a better report will be built. This leads us to another theme, which is uh, the uh, raising awareness about the occurrence of crimes in the community where we're stationed. This awareness raising obviously will condition the response from the officer towards the problems that each of us are involved with with our facing. Generally, our policing is focused on, um, on, on the gravest of crimes or in attending to the gravest of crimes. But when we um, speak with our communities, we learn that obviously what affects the community the most are not like grave or serious crimes, but rather the small things that, if worked jointly with us, can be solved. Logically, the implementation of this philosophy, from my experience, well, truly shows that the success levels are incremented with a better participation of women in all processes. 
And uh, during my career, when I was the uh, head of the community policing, I had the good fortune of uh, um, admitting many new women officers into my um, into my into my works. There is a lot of commitment around this issue, and for us, it is very important to keep uh, making headway. During the last couple of years. So with the increase of the presence of women in our institution, we've seen substantial changes in behavioral terms and in the way that officers related to the institution and in how their service is improved. And this is something that the police is able to provide. This importance has also much to do with or rather, the implementation of this philosophy has much to do with how we perceive and how we value the work that each of our officers do, no matter whether they're men or women or the gender that uh, they identify with. This is logically a learning process uh, for our police force. I also speak from experience when saying that many colleagues will speak about this further, um, depending on their roots and depending on their um, training and on their education, we we'll all agree that this is an ongoing process that will generate change in behavior. In our country, we are at a very important point in time. We are currently self-assessing to see how we're doing around this issue. We have the fortune of having Commissioner Sue Reyes, and it is an honor for me to call her my colleague. We've been in constant contact with her. Uh, I've been able to have first-hand experiences around the struggle that she's gone through. It hasn't been easy for her, and I publicly speak about it and say that she is always at the forefront, and we're always, uh, we never give up with the struggle, and we are close to seeing the fruits of her labor. This self-assessment will lead us to have a clearer understanding of the situation that we're going through. If we speak about community policing and gender equality, we can't separate the one from the other. If we don't acknowledge uh, the rights of our officers inside the institution, it can be very difficult for us to ensure the very same rights with the rest of our citizenship. If there's no internal change, then it would be even more complicated for us to achieve that change with the citizenship. While it's true uh, not all policemen are good, they must all be fair in meting out justice. So I think that today it will bring us a more clearer vision as to the next steps that we should employ institutionally to establish a true gender policy within the institution. So we'll be able to share in the future more important headway and experiences that we'll have collected. One of the aspects that have provided for this is the opening offered to us from our higher authorities. In the sense that they've given us the opportunity to do this, they've given us the opportunity to turn the mirror towards ourselves and to see how we're performing. Logically, it's not something that we're able to do internally because the information would not be entirely unbiased. So I should also acknowledge uh, the valuable support uh, that the teachers are helping out with uh, in our national police force. In the future, we should be able to speak about even greater experiences than the ones that we've had in the, um, the short term past. So this rapport, this relationship between the implementation of the community policing philosophy, which leads us to being more effective in our everyday work and in how we um, attend to our community, as well as the acknowledgement of the equality of all of our officers within the institution will be great. Regrettably, there are certain um, parts of the police office, uh, the police force, where we don't have entire representation. The commission, Zuma, is actually the flag bearer of this movement, if you will. This process of incorporating women in our institution is uh, something that we regrettably started off a bit late. 
wonder during the next couple of years we will achieve a better uh, presence of women because our higher processes are ongoing and are about to be slightly effective. I would also like to be respectful of time. I know that I'm about to uh, run out on it, but I would like to congratulate you for the event that you're organizing here. And in the future, I hope to have the opportunity of seeing all of you again to share any new experiences uh, which GCAP is uh, streamlining within our institution. So they can also be of uh, benefit uh, for other institutions and other colleagues who are also working in this regard. So without further ado, thank you very much. It's great to see you, even if only through a screen, but at least I can see that you're there, that you're doing well, and it's nice to see you. A pleasure. Thank you, Commissioner Alessandro. Yeah, unfortunately, your time is always against us at webinars, but it's really important to hear your views on there. And as you know, I, I completely agree with you regarding the importance of community policing and participation, both from the community and internally. And I always, benefit and, and, and love to hear your experience and insights on community policing as well uh, and talking about participation i'll now pass over to the uh the experts and, and the the panelists so over to edward nino and i will close off my uh, video and uh, look forward to the conversations many thanks again Dan, thank you very much. Uh, also, thanks to all of the participants uh, who spoke uh, their introductory remarks. My name is Edward Nino. I am an officer of the Police Advisory Program in Honduras uh, through uh, DICA and uh, through the uh, Citizen Safety Unit Program from the Swiss Corporation. So welcome each and every one of you. We welcome to the panelists. We have over 300 people online connect, uh, um, from various parts of the world. I also want to remind you that we have simultaneous translation in English and in Arabic. Welcome to the panelists. Now I want to open with um, a reflection. A year ago, uh, thinking about having all of these people in an online academic event, you know, having over 300 people from different nationalities from different continents in the very same screen was something unheard of. Uh, this, uh, well, this is something that may have happened due to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. It changed the soul and it changed the way that we do our work every single day. One of the issues that had to be abruptly transformed uh, um, was uh, the uh, levels of the police report and the way that our institutions do prevention and contention around gender-based violence. This problem was made even more visible internationally due to the pandemic and it needs to be further studied, understood and um, adapted. But above all, it needs to be responded to according to the different contexts. Gender-based violence needs to uh, acknowledge the importance of having gender-aware institutions and uh, to generate processes both internal and external with uh, those that are carried out with the communities to whom we serve. Today is a very important day. It is very important because uh, today we commemorate the International Days of the Elimination of Violence Against Women. Uh, this day, which is commemorated once every year, is important for us. It is the date uh, that we should keep in mind, not only today, but rather the 365 days per year, we should be able to eradicate all sorts of gender violence, especially violence against women and uh, uh, and girls, which has been a historically um, ignored issue. Even before the COVID-19 pandemic, gender-based violence, especially domestic violence, was already one of uh, the greatest human rights violations against the world. According to a UN report, during the last 12 months, and pay attention to this number, during the last 12 months, 242 million girls and women between 15 and 49 years of age around the world have suffered sexual violence or physical violence from a, a sentimental partner. 
with the COVID-19 pandemic, this number is growing considerably, which is why we are all meeting here today during this webinar, which was organized by GCAP and by the National Honduran Police Force uh, through their gender division and their uh, unit of organization framed within the uh, citizen safety uh, program from the Swiss Corporation. And it is called uh, how Latin American police officers are facing gender-based violence during COVID-19. So as of now, we're opening a space for discussion amongst us all so we can gather um, knowledge, best practices and experience around the policing and security sector in all of our countries and in all of our contexts. The purpose of this is to gather relevant accommodations which could be useful in the police work and in the security sector and in the institutional strengthening around the prevention of gender-based violence around the world. I would like to welcome the panelists Commissioner Sulma Reyes, she is the head of the Gender Equality Division in the National Honduran Police Force, welcome. Also Lieutenant Colonel Alejandro Castro, he is the head of Human Rights of the uh, General uh, Colombian Police Force. Also the Lieutenant Colonel Janet Montesinos, head of the uh, National Gender Department of the Dominican Police. Also Master Victor Aguilar, who is the uh, General Director of Policies and Development of the Secretariat of Security and Protection in Mexico City. Also, Commissioner William Lemons from the Investigation Police in the Department of Human Rights and Gender Identity in Chile. Also, uh, the uh, lead Commissioner Norman Ciso Sorio, who's the uh, head of human rights in the uh, Paraguay uh, Police Force, and Major Diaz, who is an advisor of the ongoing education in the Peruvian Police Force. This panel will be divided into five sessions. I will very briefly, after providing this introduction, um, uh, generate um, instructions on questions. And uh, we will begin the uh, first session presently. Uh, we have a first question where the uh, National Police of uh, Honduras, uh, through Commissioner Suma, will be uh, doing a presentation on the interinstitutional coordination that has been carried out on behalf of the Honduran Police and which is still ongoing. This is think about how the uh, gender uh, division has tried to do some prevention in this regard. So Commissioner Soma, you have a couple of minutes. Thank you for your assistance. Good morning, each and every one of the panelists invited to this important international event, uh, which was planned, coordinated and developed by the National Honduran Police and by DECA. Uh, through its police advisory program. I would also like to greet all of the officials participating from around the world, uh, from each of their police officers. Uh, we do have over 300 people here, which was confirmed by Colonel Edward Nino. Also, I would like to send a greeting out there to General Orlin Salato. He is the General Inspector of the National Police Force. Thank you all for your introductory remarks. Also, thanks to Commissioner Savas from the Bureau of Modernization and External Financing. Each and every one of you, welcome. On behalf of the uh, Minister of State uh, and in the Dispatch of Defense, um, on behalf of uh, uh, retired General Julian um, Pacheco, and also on behalf of our General Director, General Jose Tafida Aguilar Moran, welcome everyone. Now, regarding the question and the issue, 2020 has been a year of many difficulties for our country. First, because we, we didn't expect, neither were we prepared to face a pandemic like the one that COVID-19 has opposed. Well, I don't believe that anywhere in the world where we prepared in Honduras was no Currently, there are 2,376 Hondurans who have died due to COVID. Um, after that, we had uh, the storms Eta and Iota, which have currently uh, destroyed our country, which have led to many casualties and many um, physical losses. There are 57 casualties from the first storm and 24 disease from the second storm. One of the first actions and strategies that the police has employed 
uh, due to these emergencies, especially around the COVID-19 and the damages that the disease brings through, you know, the violence at the personal uh, level in the society. Well, due to the complexities of this confinement, because it has been one of the first measures that our government has provided for, you know, it has ordained a confinement. So the first thing that we did is that we sent out a report to all of the directors and the commanders in the metropolitan and departmental areas ordering them to provide priority to the attention of the police reports made uh, due to gender-based violence, especially those um, dealing with uh, domestic, family and inter-family violence. Since international principles request the state to apply due diligence thereof, one of the first things that the police did was to give priority to the police reports against one of the above. And like Commissioner Osabas has said, due to uh, the contact that we have with the community, with our police officers, we were able to do that. Also, the South Platte work that we did in coordination with different state institutions, we were able to sit down and work and coordinate and plan what we'd be able to do when facing this pandemic. Due to the situation, you know, police reports skyrocketed, especially due to domestic violence, and we received this as to the 9-11 uh, emergency phone line. This coordination between state institutions and uh, women's organizations and civil society also included uh, feminist networks, human rights defender networks, and we all work uh, to do um, prevention of gender-based violence. We're also uh, doing communication campaigns, uh, more than just unifying our campaigns. Things, and we have to uh, raise the voice together um, against the gender-based violence and we these affirmation campaigns and we promote the rejection of gender-based violence, especially a rejection towards uh, the assailant. These campaigns were carried out through different uh, media outlets, uh, televised outlets as well as print media and social networks, also in the uh, web pages of the police floors as well as in the web pages of our um, friendly uh, partners. We were all sharing information around this because based on that, the different women's organizations at all and everyone involved in preventing gender-based violence, we've been able to have a permanent real-time chat communication. All women's organizations are in constant communication with us about the activities that are being carried out. Now, due to confinement and uh, um, as, uh, coming from this emergency, as I said, we had an increase in the uh, police reports that the 9-11 phone line received. Since there is uh, one single response line, namely 9-11, and we were able to agglomerate all of the um, reports. Previously, there were different lines through which police reports would be made. Um, there was one which was specifically devoted to uh, family violence and the debate violence, but all of the police reports are now centralized into the 9-11 line. And so we've been able to see that there's immediate reactions from the National Police Force. As long as the uh, police report has a concrete information and if it has reference points that we may investigate, the uh, victim can be responded to. Another strategy that we put into practice is that we activated the different protocols, the different attention guidelines, and the comprehensive services. There are many institutions uh, that answer to these services, such as Ciudad Mujeru, or Women's City. It is a place where attention is truly comprehensive because they respond to different kinds of violence. So, and also at Ciudad Mujer, women are given a monetary incentive so they're able to become entrepreneurs after their um, situation. But let's also recall that we're under confinement and it's very difficult for women to make a police report and to flee from their uh, toxic environment. We did this so we could have some advocacy 
and uh, to ensure that we provide essential services to victims, uh, to provide health services to them, justice, um, shelters when necessary. Mind you, we have very few shelters uh, for uh, women in the country, but they are definitely necessary at the moment. In certain cases, we haven't had a place to shelter women who flee from their partners, a place for them to feel safe, you know. But with strategies like these, we also include legal advisory for them. There are certain courts, mainly the uh, domestic violence courts, were closed. And maybe only three or four times a month where they're open to receive reports. This was very difficult for us because the person who had to solve the issue was the prosecutor, or they had to provide a, uh, um, a rendezvous date at a future date for the victim. So the process was very slow, you know. And uh, sometimes hearings uh, were proposed only one or two months after the um, police report had been made but we're working on that. And we're also starting to train the personnel, trainings on how they should respond to women. Currently, you know, uh, we should differentiate uh, a woman who is going to make a police report uh, due to gender-based violence uh, has even more problems due to the confinement. So our response should be different as well because they're confined with their assailant. Also, we're giving training to police officers on how their attention should be dealt and especially on the fact that it should be immediate. It is in this way that we are avoiding um, further events. Now, briefly, those have only been some of the actions or some of the strategies that the National Hunter and Police Force has enforced. And uh, maybe next, I would like to be able to look further into uh, information about this. So, I have a short video to play for you about certain campaigns that. Certain campaigns that, as a National Police Force, we've been able to carry out. If you will give me just a couple of seconds. In Honduras, we're facing two pandemics, COVID-19 and an even more silent pandemic, violence against women. The National Police is there to help you. If you are a victim of physical, psychological, or sexual violence, call immediately 911 or visit the nearest police um, post. We will immediately go to your home. We are there to help you. Excuse me, Commissioner, we get audio but no video. You don't say. Just a moment, let me try this over. Under the police force, our commitment to serve and protect. Yeah, I mean, at least we got the message, ma'am. Well, that was the most important thing. I'm so sorry we were unable to see the video. It was a really nice video, actually. And um, in regards to the report, um, as, of, or, uh, as of September, we have 3,081 police reports against uh, domestic violence and 3,032 against uh, domestic violence, and all of these have been collected by 9-11. So that's my participation around the actions that the Honduran Police Force has done. Thank you very much, Madam Commissioner, for your valuable presentation. I'd like to remind the uh, participants that at the end of the presentations, there is a Q&A portion. Should you have any questions or doubts, so you can interact with the panelists. Likewise, 
from uh, these experiences and this shared knowledge, we will be generating a report which you will all get on your email and which will be available for all participants. Thank you once again, Madam Commissioner, for the important work that you're doing. And like you said, uh, for uh, highlighting the importance of coordinating with other institutions, both at the government and with the uh, civil society, as well as different human rights defender organizations. Likewise, I would like to say that at the moment with the National Honduran Police Force, we're doing a gender self-assessment. This gender self-assessment will allow to um, to increase the visibility of women in the institution and to strengthen both internal and external processes around the gender issues and thereby will provide a more reliable service to the community. Likewise, DCAP has a guideline to carry out the gender self-assessment which is in different languages. So I entice you to go into the DCAP website where you can find our different publications around gender and the security sector in general. Thank you very much. Now let's move to the second session. During the second session, uh, we'll have representatives from Mexico, Colombia, Peru, Bolivia, Paraguay and Chile. Now, the uh, gender-based violence rates um, were increased at the global level in regards to the uh, contention measures of the pandemic, such as the confinements in many countries. This was uh, boosted because uh, people had to obligatorily coexist in a uh, reduced environment, so many times with their own assailants. These negative scenarios were reflected in homes where many times that kind of violence had never happened before. Therefore, the intervention of the panelists and the questions they may answer will offer a general perspective of how the behavior has changed in gender-based violence during the pandemic in each of the countries from which the panelists hail and their relationship with citizen safety. They will provide us with certain examples on the institutional response, both from the police as well as the rest of the sector, in attending and controlling the population. Uh, we will now pass the baton to Master Victor Ortiz from Mexico. So, Master, welcome. Thank you very much. Good morning, each and every one of you. Uh, I am representing uh, my uh, boss, uh, who uh, begs his forgiveness, but he has to attend to a special commissioner. My name is Jaime Reina, but I will be speaking for him, for my master. Now, for the federal government, uh, through the Secretariat of Citizen Safety and Protection, we would like to share our experience with you. As of 2013, Mexico has worked to streamline a national survey about home relationships to identify uh, gender-based violence. Uh, this uh, corresponds to the INE, which has been a reference point for Latin America in the provision of national statistics about uh, physical, economic, sexual, emotional, and patrimonial violence against women. So for us, taking this survey, it provides better indicators for us, uh, which will inform the actions that we do during the three levels of this government, which include federal, state, and local police officers. We've identified that uh, women 15 years onwards suffer different types of violence throughout their lives with their significant others, their spouses, their partners, or with members from their communities. We compiled information about the assailants and the places where the aggressions happened. It is important for us to consider the service because it leads us to identify the key places where these cases arise from the community and from each individual household which uh, we which should actually be the safest places for women but aren't then in 2016 we saw that six out of ten women of 15 years or older have suffered episodes of violence and this is a national statistic they suffer violence be it at home at school or at the place in which they work and this includes either physical sexual discriminatory violence etc in this context and due to the world confinement 
something that we've all experienced, you know, we're no exception to the rule of confinement, Mexico has implemented immediate and intensified actions to support women through the emergency services uh, provided by 911. Previously, Mexico have already done certain efforts to train our officers about how to receive a, a call regarding violence and how to act quickly and how to be sensitive around the attention that will be provided to the victims. So, we've been working in coordination with the municipalities, with the state, and with the federation to be more sensitive in how, in how to receive these calls. Through the 911 service, we offer serve, uh, attention to women and we also have specialized offices uh, that uh, respond uh, directly to the situation. And uh, women can also go to um, the uh, courtrooms which have open door policies and which are located in various places in each state and which coordinate with the other um, bureaus. Now, what kind of attention do women receive in these justice centers which have open door policies? They can get psychological support, also medical support. They can get a social worker. They can also get legal advice. We try to ensure that the attention is comprehensive so women have many tools at hand to take decisions and uh, that way to be able to change their lives, uh, especially during this pandemic. No doubt the number of emergency calls has increased uh, during the confinement, as has already been said before. It's actually increased in 45.8% more than the uh, usual behavior that we uh, were able to record, you know, much more than on an everyday basis. Now, control this unusual situation, Mexico was no exception, and we also disseminated much information through social media, where we evinced step by step what the obligations of the police force is and what they should do in attending to the victims. We do this to guarantee attention to the victims. In general, these are some of the actions that Mexico has implemented in the three levels of the police offices with the purpose of ensuring that women are better informed, more prepared, and that they work hand in hand with the authorities to take the decisions that they're able to and to avoid um, further acts of violence against them. This is as far as my intervention goes, so thank you. Uh, thank you to the representative of Mexico. Now we pass the baton during, um, during this second session to the representative of the National Colombian Police Force, Lieutenant Colonel Alejandro Castro. Welcome. Thank you and good morning to everyone. I represent the National Colombian Police um, and I would like to provide a, a very special uh, welcome from our General Director, General Oscar Anderson, who delegated me to participate in this excellent event as the Head of Human Rights from the National Colombian Police. Regarding the question that was given to us by our moderator, I will um, base my answer on a presentation that I have here for you, where I let you know a bit about the um, performance around gender-based violence, um, namely the one that the police has offered within the Colombian context. So, we have, as I said before, and as our Mexico um, counterpart said, certain platforms to help women out in conjunction with the um, general, uh, with the attorney general of the country. In our country, we have reinforced the legal aspects around uh, femicide and intrafamily violence. So we get the uh, police calls, and uh, we have not per se seen an increase in the amount of emergency calls. We get maybe um, a bit over 31,000 calls every year, and uh, those have been increased due to the pandemic. So we can, we have actually seen a very minor decrease, but further on, I'm going to explain these numbers even more. So um, 
we've been able to see a so-called small reduction around um, gender-based violence and emergency calls. The Colombian Police Force has focused on a differential focus for their prevention activity to the attention of the calls that we get every single day to our line. Um, very much like Honduras, who has a 911 line, we have another line, which is the 123 line. And we also coordinate with the Attorney General of the Nation with these emblematic uh, calls. Now, we have seen an increase in regards to intrafamily violence, but it is a very minimal increase. We had uh, 60,219 ca cases in 2019, and we have very similar numbers to 2020. Now, this behavior has also been uh, characterized by our system, and it has been able to be differentiated between intrafamily violence, conjugal intrafamily violence, fraternal intrafamily violence, you know, violence affected by siblings, and also psychological violence. And so we've been able to uh, differentiate between each and characterize each one, which help us to focus the kind of response or action that we provide. The cases um, were reported, as you can see from this slide, um, is uh, family violence the most. And in this slide, we explain all of the uh, different behaviors that we've been able to record. And also within the um, obligatory preventive confinement that has been established, has seen an increase in 30% of these uh, behaviors. So the uh, national police, within the framework of what Commissioner Ray has uh, previously said, uh, we've been able to maintain the support provided to a presidential program that is led by the, um, by the council's office for women. Ever since 2015, they've been able to have a very close relationship with the National Police Force to generate an exclusive line that provides orientation and help to women who call. National, the National Police um, assigned a certain of our officers exclusively to attend this line. These officers um, have to have a, a uh, process focused on providing more adequate advisory orientation. Um, some of them are attorneys, or some of them are psychologists, and all of them are focused on attending to these victims. This is the line that first told us that there was an increase in regards to interfamily violence and that it could be exacerbated by the pandemic. What does this mean? As you could see in the previous slide, in regards to um, penal phone calls, we don't see an increase, but in regards to the attention to particular calls, there is an increase, which leads us to the conclusion that indeed, the channels of access to justice are not the most adequate ones during the pandemic. But if there are effective channels in the administration of the calls, there are. The 123 lines is one of the nationally scaled lines uh, that inform our efforts during the pandemic. It not only informs our work, but it also helps us uh, better attend to the victims. And the uh, national operator of this line has an institutional capacity at the national scale to respond to cases uh, that are happening in the field, and which may be answered almost immediately. I mean, if there's a woman that is suffering from violence and calls to report it, the operator, who is a police officer, is able to respond immediately and articulate the institution capacity provided to them so they can respond in real time and go and detain the assailant or separate the woman from the environment where she is suffering her violence. Now this number of calls which was uh, increased allowed us together with the council's office to say that the capacity that we have uh, to attend to these calls is actually lacking. Uh, we have attended many calls, but we haven't attended all of them because we don't have the capability to do so with the amount of operators out there. 
So we did a study and we have been having conversations with all of our related agencies to be able to better adequate our schedules and our police force. We were able to schedule uh, certain um, times and we saw that there were peak times for emergency calls between 10 a.m. and 5 p.m., for instance. So during that time, we were able to schedule even more agents answering calls. And in low peak time, then we had uh, just enough backup officers. So this led us to getting more justice operators and assigning more exclusively to this line. And, uh, especially during December, when we're going to have special holidays, of course, we're going to need to have more officers out there with more capacity to answer calls uh, during uh, the uh, festivity of December. Now, regarding the reported captures, also have um, we also have divided uh, the uh, numbers of captured assailants depending on the kind of violence that they affected. You can see those on the screen, and here are the numbers of captured assailants divided in by the uh, kind of violence that they were um, arrested for. Now let's move into um, other actions, and it's sad that I don't have that much time to go in depth into this, but what did all of the above led us to? I think that the best mechanism that, uh, we, that, that we did or that we employed was a strategy disseminated with all of the police officers to uh, ensure that they are not only leaders but also educators of the within each of their commissions. We have Commissioner Luis, for instance, uh, who um, took a community focus uh, to help the uh, women in their communities. Um, I don't know whether you know the context of what the National Colombian Police Force did, you know. They went to the communities uh, with loudspeakers and uh, they did aerobics classes, for instance, uh, which helped out uh, to monitor the situation in the communities. So we try to do something similar. We try to have the kind of approach towards our communities to keep very open channels. Uh, we also did home patrols. What do these refer to? Home patrols refer to a, um, the, to a national surveillance uh, component which integrates capabilities of criminal investigation, police intelligence, um, teen teenage and adolescence issues, and citizen protection issues, as well as strategic communications. Basically, the home patrols link various specialties and various officers to integrate the work that they do into one single um, um, answer to domestic violence. So around this strategy, we have been able to open many channels to receive different reports, not only through the official line, but through WhatsApp um, and chats, for instance. And we've carried out campaigns to make these women more uh, visible, to make their strife more visible. That way, we've been able to provide information to women who live further out and who didn't know that this was happening. And we're able to also uh, take these cases towards a more institutional articulation. Commissioner Sulma was talking about the lack of um, uh, shelter capacities. And uh, this also happens in Colombia. Not all of the territorial authorities have the capability to um, take the victim away from their home and to put them in a shelter where they can feel more protected. Many of the victims have to be uh, living with their assailant in the same space, which is not okay. So um, just as the police works 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we have to set up an institution which is prepared to articulate the work with these uh, populations specifically. So, like I said, we did the home patrols, uh, we did some institutional strengthening, we improved the capabilities of the police as an articulator within the framework of the institutional coordination that should be. And um, there, these are only some of the things that we have been able to do in regards to setting up more effective communication channels so the victims can be completely articulated. Now, finally, I would like to close my intervention by reaffirming that 
indeed, we do much emphasis to stop violence against women, but the Home Patrol component has helped us identify that the issue of domestic violence inside families, inside family members, has actually increased despite our efforts. And violence happens not only against women, but also against children, small girls, and other household members which uh, leads us to better uh, respond to vulnerable populations, including, for instance, uh, people with handicaps and uh, the elderly. Many times, uh, these populations live within the same household and they are subject to the same kind of violence as women. So those are only some of our challenges and some of the actions that we have taken to try to help out with the situation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Colonel Castro. That was very interesting to get to know the follow-up and monitoring that you do about the uh, statistics on gender-based violence, as well as the kind of the variables that you were able to identify through your monitoring. It is important to know this, because like I said at the beginning, the uh, pandemic affects, us, uh, affects all households, and it leads us to quickly adapting the work that we do. So what you said, you know, the uh, special line that you established and uh, the uh, deficiencies that you uh, identified were very important because it leads to a more comprehensive strategy, if I uh, didn't misunderstand, where you can bring together officers with different specialties and focus them towards a common goal. So thank you very much. Now, this same question will be answered by our representatives from Peru, uh, Major Jesus Diaz. So, Major, welcome. Right, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, very good, very well. So, first of all, I would like to apologize to all participants if at some point my language doesn't sound inclusive, you know. It's part of my learning process, and I admit that. It's something that I'm trying to improve every day to have a, a better society. This learning process has led me to um, attend to a conference. The conference was around the theme that, well, for instance, I, I kept telling women that they had to thank us for taking care of them, but that was something very bad that I was saying, and it's something that I have to learn. I would like to thank uh, Commissioner Suma, uh, Ms. Christina, and everyone else who let me know that my message was not adequate and that it's the other way around, that it's actually men who have to thank women for the opportunity of, of knowing that we're wrong and that we have to improve because they must have the equality that they seek out. Now, um, in Peru, uh, according to I uh, that that saw information between 2019 and 2020, they've seen that femicides have decreased. At least that's what the statistics tell us. According to statistics, we see that the rates have actually decreased by 17%. What I have here in red in the graph refers to times of pandemic. We have had a very um, drastic confinement in our country. And we see that there is a relative trend This is the interpreter. So we basically have to increase uh, the um, you know, to increase the kind of work that we do towards um, gender-based violence. Uh, we have many cases of violence against women that we have attended to. And uh, there is a 52% of increase in emergency calls in regards to 2019. There are over uh, 5,000 uh, sexual violence crimes that have been registered and dealt with ever since then. Now, we have the same problem that Commissioner Suma had. Um, you know, we have uh, very few shelters available, but uh, we um, but, but there's a law, law number 1470, which fine-tunes the protection mechanisms available and the channels of communication to help us see that um, 
that, that we have to improve and that we have to find new shelters and that we have to find new uh, capabilities for us. Now, the aforementioned law is a law for the uh, prevention of violence against women and girls. And it is a law which seeks to integrate and articulate five institutions, especially, as well as various support institutions, to fight against violence against women. One of them is uh, the uh, Attorney General's Office, uh, the uh, National Peruvian Police Force, and the uh, Ministry of Women and Vulnerable Populations. Yes, we have one such ministry, whose purpose is to promote and to provide protection to women's rights due to gender issues, including vulnerable populations, be those who have uh, uh, been displaced or others. What this law does is that it provides the guides for us to take protection measures under gender focus, and uh, to focus on uh, human rights intersectionality as well. There is a necess necessity to recognize the systematic answer that has to be meted out in regards to the systematic violence that men enact. And I'm sorry if I'm rushing through this due to time, but this law tells us tells the National Police Board that there are seven aspects around which we should work. Um, we should provide guidelines uh, to emit out supervision and control actions. Then we have to promote the creation of a specialized unit for this purpose, which, uh, leads, which includes an educational component. Then to implement attention modules to attend uh, to uh, violence against women, and to do this uh, with, uh, uh, with specialized personnel. Then we should guarantee police services uh, with sensitive uh, personnel, then to uh, have an opportune attention to the implementation and fulfillment of these protection measures, and then to expedite the service to facilitate all of the above, and then to monitor everything else. This has led the police um, academy and all of the uh, education-related institutes to align their educational programs towards this issue, not only human rights issues, but specifically in issues of the fight against um, the violence against women. So we are currently working on that and trying to uh, join our processes and to uh, generalize them to ensure that all of us are on the same page. Our purpose here is not to solve femicides. Our purpose is not to just attend to victims, but rather to avoid this from happening. It is very, it, it's, it's an aberration to have just one case of uh, violence against women than to have 2,000, you know. So we have to work to avoid them from happening. And for the National Peruvian Police Force, we are aware that our participation around this regard must be fundamental and uh, we must train each and every one of our agents, starting from the moment the cadet enters uh, the academy to the point that they uh, assume their positions. Three or four years ago, we eliminated the uh, Bureau of Human Rights in the office, but I don't know why that happened. As far as I understand, I think that that bureau will be reopened with more qualified personnel and with focus towards uh, gender-based violence. Thank you. But thank you, Major, for your interesting intervention. And uh, once again, there are important takeaways here. We have to monitor our numbers and to ensure that the government and the institutions are able to react immediately to the problem. I also found it very interesting to see that you had a reduction in uh, certain crimes uh, at the same time as you had an increase in other crimes. We know that gender-based violent crimes in majoritarily don't uh, happen in public spaces, but rather within households or confined spaces. So that is yet another takeaway. Well then, um, thank you for that. Uh, with the same question, we will now hear from uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Janet Montesinos uh, from the Bolivian Police. Welcome. Thank you very much and uh, welcome each and every one of you in this room here this morning. I would like to specially greet the DCAP team who made my participation possible and especially who made it possible to carry out this event. Uh, uh, please receive a very cordial welcome, each and every one of you. 
Uh, I am Lieutenant Colonel Yanet Montesinos. Um, Lieutenant Colonel, we can't hear you. Okay, um, so we're having technical issues. Hello, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, ma'am, yes, we can hear you now. Okay, here I am. Yeah, you know, I'm from a mobile device now because regrettably signal is very bad down here, but I shall continue now. So I was saying that I should tell you that according to the statistical data that I was given by the uh, Special Task Force Against Violence, which is a specialized organization of the Bolivian Police Force, during the pandemic there have been 104 femicides registered and um, 20,834 emergency calls uh, related to gender-based violence, out of which the violence that is most prevalent is domestic violence and the um, uh, violation of the infants, children, and teenagers. Based on this, I would like to say that the Bolivian police has two offices, one of them for investigation, which is the special force to fight against uh, violence, uh, which uh, dates back to 2013. And um, their functions uh, are based on Law 348, which is the comprehensive law to guarantee uh, a violence-free life for women. Um, this office is based uh, does investigation mostly, but due to I'm so sorry, but I think that we lost your feed, Madam Colonel. So we've um, used legal advisors, uh, social workers, and psychologists who integrally deal with the cases uh, that are presented uh, with the uh, special force of fight um, against uh, violence. I will also speak about this um, office for training that we've set up uh, and which has worked uh, throughout this health crisis uh, by employing different activities. These activities range from virtual webinars uh, to the uh, dissemination of Law 348, the dissemination of 1173 law, which modifies the Law 348, and uh, it, it has uh, raised more awareness about these laws not only with internally within the police, but also um, externally, they disseminated information to the population through uh, um, the means of technology. Likewise, I should say that you know, there is a, a National Bureau of Human Rights within the uh, Bolivian Police Force. I belong to that, that bureau, actually. And uh, our purpose is to disseminate and promote human rights applied to police work. So within that task, uh, we've been able to provide a, a series of events and activities, most of them online, though, you know, awareness training, you know, both for internal um, workers as well as externally to the public. This has been innovative though, uh, thanks to the international cooperation, we've been able to, we've been able to print certain flyers with basic information about the uh, communication lines available for people to make their reports and calls. These are toll free, by the way. It is the 814 line, as we call it. And we've also habilitated WhatsApp phone lines in all departments. Bolivia has nine departments, and uh, in all nine departments, we have open lines for the dissemination of information and to provide better access to victims who want to call in and who require information or action to be taken. Likewise, we have created and enforced 
a platform uh, on Facebook where we are able to disseminate the activities that we carry out every single day and where the users and the population in general can communicate with us. Also, I should uh, say that, that uh, these flyers, here's one for instance, uh, these flyers are distributed at the national level. This means that we have gone door to door, household to household, to distribute these flyers and to investigate whether there's any problem that um, they would like to report. And uh, we've identified ourselves as the Bolivian Police Force, we've identified the unit that we come from, and well, I'm certain that there are people who said there were no problems because they were compelled to, but uh, who uh, may be experiencing problems, but now they have information on how to proceed should they wish to. And we have this sticker here as well. We handed out this sticker to let people that we were open to speak with people should they have any violence problem. The majority of the people said they were okay, but they've allowed us to place this sticker on the doors of their household as a way to let people know that the police have gone through their households and have provided um, and have been able to speak with officers and know how to uh, call us or how to contact us or should they ever need us to. So in summary, those are the actions that we've implemented and that we're still implementing at the national level on behalf of the Bolivian police. Thank you very much, Colonel. Um, this shows us just how important it is to carry out different awareness campaigns and training sessions and dissemination campaigns to let people know about the laws and about the functions that we do and about the kind of police action that we can provide for them. The citizenship should know about their rights. In statistics, many times we see a certain decrease in numbers, but many times this is due because people just don't know what their institutions are able to provide. So thank you for that takeaway. I will now uh, hand the baton over to Lead Commissioner Norma Intisto from the National Paraguay Police. Good morning and a very special greeting to all of us during the a day for the elimination of violence against women. I would also like to thank DICA for their invitation and to extend my warmest welcome to our colleagues in Honduras who are going through a double pandemic which includes the tremendous natural catastrophes. What I wanted to share with you is a work that the National Police has done um, during the pandemic. The National Police Force is part of the government response to prevent, contain, mitigate, and collaborate in a different tasks. Many times they are tasks that are not entirely um, police in nature, but we are going through an extraordinary um, situation that deserves extraordinary measures. The Human Rights Department, which I represent, is always on the vanguard in complying with international standards and focusing on the legality, the responsibility, and the institutionality of our work. Regarding domestic violence, gender violence, uh, intrafamily violence, in Paraguay, we have a department for the attention of intrafamily uh, violence victims. These uh, departments are located in all 18 geographical departments of our country and uh, they are working double time due to the pandemic. Likewise, at the uh, National Police Force, that's the next slide please, we've uh, issued a contingency plan at the police level, which is the one that protects uh, female officers and all female personnel who find themselves in breastfeeding situations or under problems, as well as a program for the elderly during their confinement which is why we uh, are able to take care of our female personnel. We would also like to say that uh, the confinement during the pandemic has generated another kind of violence uh, 
in Paraguay, we had uh, various phases uh, during our quarantine. The first phase, phase zero, was obligatory, where everybody who did not have essential functions had to stay at home by law. So these people were living with aggressive people at times, and in their cases, you know, family livelihoods were interrupted or were made much more difficult. So these specialized attention uh, departments are had to work double time, especially in the interior of the country, various kilometers away from the city of Asuncion, where they kept getting many reports, and they did this work where they had to travel far away to the most remote areas to answer uh, the calls from the victims who had called saying that they were under stress due to violence. Likewise, I would like to highlight the enormous solidarity from this specialized group. Further than their police duties, they have also done many donations. They've collected non-perishables, um, coats, and they've traveled all over the country to deliver. I would also like to share with you the work that the National Police Force has done. There have been many uh, awareness talks given out against intraviolence uh, in families, and these talks have been generally directed to rural women. Women who, due to their rural context, find it difficult to go to a uh, police uh, post. But uh, with these talks, they have all of the information that they need about how to make a police report, how to, um, so they can know which are their rights as well and which are the immediate actions they can take to um, run away should they need to. Now, we obviously protect their identities, we protect um, the information, the case sensitive information, but we do disseminate general information for everyone. We also were able to facilitate the process of making a face to face emergency call. People can turn up with nothing but their identity card. We take down their information and they don't have to be accompanied by an adult person if they're underage, for instance. We also establish something that we call the easy call. The easy call is the call that they can make to 9-11 as the center for information and for reporting calls. And we also have a specific number, that's a 137 number, which corresponds to the Ministry for Women, and the 147 number, which is for the Ministry of Childhood and Adolescence. We also trained our personnel during this pandemic with the help of the Human Rights Department. We trained 375 officers from all over the country. We gave them an online course where we emphasized on the most vulnerable groups in the procedures they should do in case there were um, in, in case they needed to update their procedures regarding their work with the rural women with indigenous groups with the elderly and with young children etc also another important thing is to maintain a communication network between the police the attorney general's office the different ministries and courtrooms to collaborate and facilitate uh, things for pop the population to better monitor their cases and uh, to uh, provide a quicker response from state organizations. It is also important to talk about uh, the statistics. Our statistics uh, have to be unified, especially regarding gender-based violence. Uh, these will help us uh, do better short-term strategies, especially during the pandemic. Uh, isolation during COVID uh, has increased tension, stress, the concern of the population, as well as other factors like, for instance, many people have uh, been unemployed during this time. Also, schools have been closed during this time, as well as universities, which means that families have to live together 24-7, and this has definitely provided for certain frictions. Also, assailants have found this situation to be perfect for them to exert a controlling, aggressive, and undue behavior.
women have had more difficulties to leave their homes because here you have to get a special permit to be able to uh, go around the city or to, or you need to justify that you're an essential worker for police officers to let you go out on the street. Now, this um, bureau, this um, office um, has, um, has had to be more alert therefore and it has to be more approachable whenever women make an emergency call or whether they are found out on the uh, street also the department of um, attention to violence victims has been working double time i would also like to say that there is a human rights department which is the one in charge of designing the online trainings and we also have the uh, anti-human trafficking department which keeps working at the same rate during the pandemic and which has not closed yet and who have actually rescued many women and some of which had actually been taken out of the country during this time. There is also the Cyber Crimes Department and the IT Crimes Department. They've been working especially on the dissemination of the uh, of, of available information about the cases that there are due to the fact that people stay at home and they use technology even more, there have been much um, cyber harassment in different platforms or social networks. And uh, this bureau is in charge of responding to that crime, which has increased during the pandemic and which has been proven to um, include gender-based violence, cyber gender-based violence. So, there is also the uh, Family Affairs Department of the National Police. This is a department that supports police officers uh, who don't feel very healthy or who have certain emergencies with their families. And each and every member of the National Police Force who wants to can go to this department to find psychological or social assistance as well as any support that they're able to provide. Likewise, this year we inaugurated the uh, Women's Legal Department. The Women's Legal Department is the one that protects women from the different police posts who have been subjected to a crime. And this is a place where they are sheltered before they are taken to the courtrooms to pursue their cases. I should also say that all um, penal colonies in other countries have been closed, which is why the police officers have had to respond to the uh, crowd controls in the prisons, which has been a very serious problem for all of us. This department has therefore also attended to female prisoners. Uh, uh, should they require our attention while they are waiting for more personalized treatment at the jail. And finally, there's the statistics department, which, in, which, is, which is in charge of collecting all of the reports and statistics from all of our bureaus, and they draft the statistics um, and, and maintain the database, which helps as an input for the Bureau of Strategic Planification, so they can draft uh, the short, medium, and long-term programs to fight against all sorts of violence and other crimes. Also, I would like to say that the National Police has two representatives working very closely at the Ministry for Women in Paraguay, where they work jointly and, above all, they are disseminating and putting themselves in the service of the citizenship, especially on those who need it the most. And they keep saying that it is important to call whenever help is needed. So that's all that I wanted to share. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner, for your intervention. Um, your issue is very important. You know, you're trying to boost uh, uh, the trust that the citizens have on you. And this is an important takeaway because it will help you with your coordinated work. Now, I would like to pass a baton to Commissioner William Lemos, uh, who's quite, who has been quite patient and waiting for all of the interventions, and whose turn it is now. Well, first of all, I'd like to, um, well, first of all, I would like to thank you for 
your invitation for inviting me to this important event. I would like to extend my director's greetings to all of you. I would like to thank the uh, Geneva Center for the Security Sector Governance. Uh, I would like to thank all of the uh, presenters and participants as well. Um, can you hear me well? Yes, yes, we can hear you loud and clear, sir. Very good. So, uh, due to time constraints, I would just like to tell you that the Investigations Police in Chile, uh, or PDI, due to a Spanish acronym, it is an investigation police and a training focused one in the investigation of crimes. In this presentation, I'm just uh, showing you um, how, how the behavior has changed within our institution. Indeed, uh, it has uh, been quite variable during uh, these last years. Uh, on October 18th last year, for instance, our country had a social outburst. Um, and uh, this is uh, just me speaking, but there was an increase in violence and crime, which is why the state had to decree a national state of emergency because of the various crimes and damages to public and private property that were happening around, and which brought about an economic, um, con uh, an economic consequence which is still being dealt with. Then on March 18th of the present year, our government declared this state of um, catastrophe due to the uh, pandemic. This comes to show that our colleagues in the institutions in our country have had to face um, situations in an atypical manner and have had to reactivate the way in which they work. I would like to highlight something that uh, General Luis Osamas said. It's the fact that we have to look at things both internally and externally. I believe that it's important to mention that the PDI or the Chilean investigation police uh, had certain uncertainty among its public officials. This uncertainty about what could happen uh, with uh, families around the country. But we took the unnecessary measures in each of our bureaus and we were able to change um, the schedules for our workers and uh, the uh, schedules in general for the allocation of our officers so they could provide a better response to the requirements of the civil society. And also the Attorney General's office had to change its schedule to better um, provide an answer to the citizens and to make them feel more at ease, you know, um, in the sense that they would know that uh, the um, health normatives that would be there to help them. We are also in charge of ensuring the physical integrity of our family members. So our units had to be divided into two or three groups, depending on the location where they were, to be able to comply with the extensive deployments, uh, sometimes deployments of one or two weeks at a time, so they could answer the most remotest of areas. Also, uh, we have a special unit for um, our officers who were um, COVID positive, so they could be sequestered for at least 15 days uh, while they recovered. Another important, which I think I should highlight, is the fact that there is, there have to be a faster health awareness in our bureau and uh, we have to train our personnel about that. Also our personnel who, who turn out to be COVID positive are now all better. They're all, they are all COVID negative now and uh, they are better trained. Now, specifically in regard to gender-based violence, I should say that um, uh, there's been an increase in domestic violence. There's been an increase, and uh, these numbers were obtained from a special study that was carried out by a very prestigious firm here. But we do see certain variants in the information. This information is in agreement with uh, what many other police bureaus are saying, and uh, which uh, focuses its numbers on the amount of emergency calls, but don't necessarily 
take into consideration other sorts of, 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 of emergency reports, such as uh, remote reports or essential reports. This is a big problem for us, and we have seen especially that the increase in violence has also much to do with the increase in alcohol and substance abuse. This is important for the investigations that we carry out because it informs what is the basic foundation of the crimes that are happening and how our investigations should be modified. This protocol that I'm showing you, for instance, has been created for the answer or the response that we offer to the different uh, sorts of crimes that we receive. This protocol includes the use of technological tools that will help us advance in the process of our investigations with the supervision of the Attorney General's office. This uh, is something that helps out uh, by using special IT uh, tools uh, such as Zoom meetings or Microsoft Teams meetings for us to have real time and constant communication with the other related uh, counterparts. And another very complex thing that we have had to work with is on a process to deal with physical harm. This is a process that we're showing on the screen right now. It is the process that we follow whenever there is a victim who is physically harmed and the kind of response that has to be provided to them, especially considering the fact that many of our hospitals are now COVID specific or have other um, or have specific actions that need to be taken before admitting a patient. This is quite different from what we saw during normal periods. We are going through a very specific and exceptional time in our lives. And so our work is always aimed to reinforcing the policies to protect women and uh, populations at risk within the households. So here, uh, we see that the numbers are a silent but quite visible reality that women are going through and which we must answer for. Thank you very much, Edward. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you for your excellent intervention. And also, thanks to all of the uh, participants who we can see have uh, not logged out. It is important, or it was important for us to have seen what the different police offices do according to the attention, prevention, and contention of gender-based violence, specifically in moments of crisis, uh, such as the one that the COVID-19 pandemic has presented. Now, we've received certain questions, and we've tried to fuse them uh, uh, to get some answers, and. Uh, if we don't answer some of your questions, then at least we're taking note of them and afterwards we're going to send the answers to all of the emails for the participants who registered for this event. We'll send you a summary thereof and if at some point you would like to expand on some information that is extremely valuable for you to apply in your own context, then definitely we could also do that. Now, uh, this question refers to session number three specifically, which goes to Colombia, Bolivia, and Chile. And I ask the participants to answer the question in no more than two minutes. These are specific questions, and we are um, and we are kind of out of time. But um, it's been quite important for us to know what the police officers are doing. So. The question is, what have been the main challenges uh, that your police corps in your different uh, security services have dealt with when attending to and preventing gender-based violence during the pandemic? And what are the actions that you have taken to solve those? So, Colonel Castro, let's hear from you first. Well, since I only have two minutes, I'm going to focus on one thing. There are many challenges. Yes, this is a new issue for us. And we should all present and propose innovative, creative proposals that are fine attuned to each of our contexts. I think that one of the biggest uh, difficulties that we have in Colombia around these issues is the articulation, the interinstitutional articulation, and the capacities in the territories, especially in rural areas, but also in urban areas, because uh, their characteristics are different. So those capacities uh, uh, need an articulation. And the main responsibility in this issue shouldn't belong only to the uh, police forces. 
this requires a true integration. So in a more opportune manner, we're able to deal with prevention, with control, and with protection to women and their families. That way, we would be able to mitigate this kind of violence. So I think that's my answer, really. Articulation is my answer. That's been the greatest challenge for us, an adequate articulation so we can provide a more institutional response to the territories that require most of us. Thank you very much, Colonel Castro. Now we'll hear from the representative from Bolivia. And I would also like to uh, uh, fuse this. The Colonel did say this, we did have one final question, but we're going to fuse it into the question that I asked you more generally. Besides everything that I asked, that I asked, what recommendations could you give other police forces to deal with uh, gender-based violence? So the representative from Bolivia, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. The main challenge for us, I mean, there's many challenges, but the main one for all of our police officers, I should say, is getting to know the women, the children, the teenagers who are victims of violence and who don't have access to making a police report or to make an emergency calls. Some of them are forced into living with their families. Some of them are confined into their houses. And therefore, victims of violence don't always have access to the channels of communication, no matter how much we try to disseminate them. Which is why within the campaigns that we have done, we have tried to habilitate special toll-free communication lines to receive information on a 24-7 basis. Now, my recommendation for all police forces, from my own perspective, maybe the most important thing would be on how, how you approach the population, how you do interinstitutional coordination to eradicate, or at the very least mitigate, the enormous numbers that we're getting regarding gender-based violence cases. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let us now hear from Commissioner Williams from the uh, Chilean Investigation Police. Thank you. Um, can you hear me well, Edward? Yes, perfect. Good. Well, um, I really, I really like to work with strong ideas. Regarding the question that was asked of us, uh, I would say that the greatest challenge for the uh, PDI in Chile would be internal issues, you know, how to change internally to be able to mirror the internal changes externally. Now, internally, for instance, we have to, we have to be more flexible with the functions that we do in a cross-sectional way. For instance, schedules, we have to change our schedules and changing schedules and, uh, um, and our dispatch was extremely important. We also had to create special work groups and special units who could provide a better response to what the population required from us. Uh, even more than that, uh, you know, not only did we have to change our schedules and the kind of police forces that we deployed all over the place, but we also had to confirm uh, to the society that we were there for them and uh, that way we could try to keep them calm. Whenever we received an emergency call, whenever we had an important case that we had to answer for, we had to habilitate two specialized departments one of them for the analysis and monitoring of gender-based violence support, and another department which takes charge of the research that the first department shows, and then they act upon them. Uh, this uh, helps us uh, to ensure that uh, we can foresee what's happening in various departments and uh, what kind of trends there are in society so we can go to the victim whenever they call us or so we can foresee where we can expect problems to be so we can dispatch our forces even better or, or in a more adequate manner. And then, of course, the other uh, national organizations have the um, responsibility of trying the cases that we've discovered. And of course, we must hold another challenge is taking care of the uh, health challenges due to the COVID-19 pandemic, because all of the above has to be carried out at the same time as we do social distancing, as we do health, 
particulars and uh, we have to approach the victim during times when they're supposed to be confined. So I'd say those are the challenges. Um, in this regard, I should, I should let you know that to date, we've been able to obtain uh, over an 80% of acceptance, citizen acceptance of the national survey that we gave them. Maybe as a recommendation, um, I should say that we are working with the Ministry for Women in dissemination campaigns, both internally and externally. And these campaigns are quite potent. They're online, but there's also some printed material, some articles that we publish as well, and we hand them out to the citizenship door to door. Uh, finally, I also agree with the importance of education and training, and that is what we are devoting much time for, to train each of our um, officers, not only in COVID matters, but also on gender-based matters. And we're doing this with the support of the uh, Gender Unit and with the Ministry for Women. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes, everything that the panelists have said is extremely important. Once again, um, I'd like to tell the participants that even the publicity or the uh, campaigns or the videos that we have shown during this presentation, we're going to send all of those to you so you can try to replicate or adapt them to your own country's context. How the uh, much like the previous panelists have said, uh, the pandemic has uh, forced us to adapt quite quickly with some of our institutional processes in all of our police forces and in the security sector. Undoubtedly, all of the countries have had lessons and experiences which will be important for us to document and to share and maybe replicate for the attention of future crises, not only in pandemics such as the current one, but also in other crises which may have more of a gender focus. There are many other uh, questions that the participants have written down. There is one for Peru, Paraguay, Honduras, and Mexico. So um, remember that if you're going to answer the question, you have only two minutes. The question is, what have been the main lessons learned about public policies or institutional strategies generated, and which organizations or sectors have been key partners to deal with the gender violence during the pandemic? Um, I, I remind you, you can um, answer this in two minutes, and you could also include a recommendation if you would like to other police forces to deal with the above. So let's have um, our commissioner from Paraguay. Well, uh, let's see, time constraints. What recommendations could I give to other police forces? Basically, work as a team, gender based violence is something that requires a multidisciplinary character from all of you. So work as a team with your ministries for women in each of your countries, with your attorney general's office, with the health ministry, who are the ones who draft the certificates and the medical reports, and work training these state organizations. It's very important for a doctor who um, attends to a, a victim, for the nurse who has to heal her wounds, for instance, for all of them to be aware about this issue so they can provide a differentiated attention and a true and a true response, a true holistic response. So my answer would be to work in a multidisciplinary team. Who have been our greatest allies? I'd say that it's the Ministry of Women. They're in permanent campaigns with us, and they've been more so during the campaign. Currently, we have a campaign called Get In, because generally when, when there is a, a sort of violence um, reported, what many people say is, oh, get out of it, don't, don't look into the situation, but we say, no, get in, take charge, do this, report. So we have a campaign like that, you know, where we tell people that it's okay to speak out. 
um, I think that the police should also work very closely with the citizenship. They should patrol the streets. If people can't come to our police offices to do the reports, then, I mean, it would be great if we had the uh, means and, the, uh, and all of the willingness for the specialized personnel so they could patrol neighborhoods and knock on doors. But at least we have police officers who walk around the streets and who talk with people so they can inform them about what's going on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Commissioner. Now let's have Major Diaz from Peru. Right, one of the main lessons learned is that indeed an articulated work where all voices can be heard is of benefit. I've shared with you the three different laws, uh, the larger laws that we have here to handle um, violence against women. Uh, among these laws, there's one that we call the Budgetary Plan for Results. This budgetary plan was a program that the uh, government did especially to uh, request a specific amount aimed at different actions. Among the different actions, uh, they wanted to um, set up a course for 8,000 officers at a time. And uh, they'd be divided into 12 uh, modules uh, with 40 uh, docents uh, that are apart from the Institute of Human Rights, and which includes a multidisciplinary team of teachers. They wanted to create a specific platform for this course, and ultimately the result of all of the above will be that they'll create flyers, pamphlets, and informational material regarding the prevention of violence against women. I believe that this articulate work has allowed us to understand that while it's true that not all entities are prepared to deal with uh, gender-based violence cases, it is important that the police officer as the first responder, it's important for them not only to be prepared but also aware about what's happening. That is why that multidisciplinary work that helps us generate these documents can help us lead us to a better um, police or more prepared police force. So next year, we're not only going to have this basic course that I mentioned, but we also want to have a training for trainers and a special course for them, which can be uh, replicated in different departments. Thank you very much, Major. Let us now hear from Commissioner Zulma Reyes from the Honduran Police. Your microphone, Commissioner, please. Right then, morning. Let's see, some lessons learned. Um, it's been teamwork, it's been a coordinated work with other government institutions and other uh, women's organizations as well as the civil society. Also, I think it's necessary to have the support of the highest command of the police. That has been the case in Honduras. Um, you know, right? Uh, not only are we working on a pandemic, but the Bureau of Operational Procedures and Continual Improvement, they created uh, the Gender Equality Working Table, which was created for us to discuss uh, the topics related with the uh, self-assessment, but also for us to present the different situations which um, are happening with the most vulnerable population. Another lesson learned is that through community visits, we're able to guarantee uh, regulations during quarantine or the restrictions that are necessary for us to employ and for us to uh, consider with women who are um, victims or for their children who are victims. So they're able to seek out support without having all of the restrictions out on the streets currently. Besides that, all of the patrol officers on the street have constant communication with our bureau, and part of the communication that was given them is to prioritize gender-based violence cases. Another thing is that we have to ensure that the mechanisms that responded to women victims, that they be considered essential services instead of having bureaus closed during the COVID pandemic. We should also be able to facilitate reports in case information is urgently required. Let's remember that domestic violence cases are always considered emergency cases and should not be restricted. Another lesson learned is that as a country, we've had to prioritize and strengthen the issue of shelters, 
and the safe houses uh, for women who temporarily need them, as well as the implementation of dissemination campaigns for women going through uh, stress at home. Also, uh, to carry out campaigns that generate resources aimed 